A game that caused a young kid to have a seizure. A game that involved an attempted murder. A game that obliterated a legend. For those who don't know, the original Spyro the Dragon was a game developed by Insomniac Games that was published by Sony Computer Entertainment and Universal Interactive Studios on September the 9th, 1998 for the PlayStation 1. As soon as the children of the world got their hands on Spyro, he was an instant classic, selling millions of copies. All it took was a small team and some hard work to create the world's favorite dragon. But unfortunately, Spyro didn't remain good for long. The day was November 5th, 2002. It was finally time for a new Spyro game. At this point, Spyro fans had been blessed with the classic trilogy of Spyro games in the late 90s, which included Spyro the Dragon, Spyro 2 Ripto's Rage, or Gateway to Glimmer if you're in Europe, and Spyro Year of the Dragon. The huge success these games earned embedded the Purple Dragon in the minds of many kids and adults alike. Along with that, two other Spyro games were released in 2001 and 2002. This time, however, for the Game Boy Advance. They were known as Spyro Season of Ice and Spyro 2 Season of Flame. While they were not as good as the original trilogy, they still received decent reception and sold fairly well, being developed by Backbone Entertainment and Digital Eclipse. After the two year break from the last mainline Spyro game being Spyro Year of the Dragon, which released in October of 2000, fans of the series were hopeful for a new game as the new hardware rolled around, being the world's best selling console of all time, PlayStation 2. Sadly, the game the fans got was Spyro Enter the Dragonfly, which was released to mixed reviews due to the peculiar nature of the game. The game was rushed beyond belief, being filled with countless glitches. For a big name like Spyro, this damaged his reputation, causing Enter the Dragonfly to be the last Spyro game to be made in the original style. That is, until 16 years later, with Spyro's return in 2018 with Spyro Reignited Trilogy. Let's not wait any longer. This is the untold truth of Spyro Enter the Dragonfly. Development on Enter the Dragonfly began just after Year of the Dragon released. Founder of Check 6 Studios, the company that was tasked with developing Enter the Dragonfly, Hello, Brent Umbrella. Oster, had his hands full at this point, as he needed to hire a bunch of employees to make Enter the Dragonfly. Luckily for him, another project at the time, titled Aliens Colonial Marines, was a game being made by a smaller team at Check 6 that was cancelled after almost two years of development. Now, developers from this cancelled game moved over to Enter the Dragonfly, and the project was officially in the works in early November of 2000. Check 6's small team grew over the months, but frequently had members quit the team because of various problems whilst working at the company. At times, Check 6 had trouble paying its employees, likely due to the fact that it was a brand new company that was run by inexperienced people. Due to the inexperience, a good amount of devs were required to spend many nights with no extra pay working up until the release to make sure the game was even playable. Even though the final game wasn't very stable, Check 6 tried the very best they could with the situation they were in to create the best game possible. On the other hand, a big problem with Enter the Dragonfly was universal, as they kept pushing Check 6 to get the game out by Holiday 2002, despite the fact the game had already been delayed with a planned release of late 2001. Now, I think that's enough exposition, let's move on to some beta ideas for Enter the Dragonfly. Originally, Spyro 4 was going to be a bit more gritty according to producer Jean-Marc Morel. With Spyro aging as the PS1 Spyro players had gotten older, Check 6 thought fans would prefer an older, more mature Spyro game. Universal, however, shut down the idea as soon as it was presented to them, so creative director Ricky Rukavina, who had previously worked on Spyro Year of the Dragon, suggested the idea of capturing dragonflies instead. He even proposed the goal of creating 25 plus levels with dynamic weather and over 100 dragonflies, even though the final game only had a mere 8 levels and 90 dragonflies. Along with that, they even sought to get Enter the Dragonfly to run at 60 frames per second, but for various reasons that just didn't work out. Just let programmer Jason Fourier explain it to you. My name is Jason Fourier. I was a junior programmer at Check Stick Studios starting in March 2002. Hey, it's Jason! When I uh, first came to Los Angeles, that was uh, 
my first video game job ever in Los Angeles and only my second video game job uh, in my career. So uh, I was pretty excited to come to Los Angeles and uh, work in the video games biz. And Check 6 looked like a cool place to do it. They um, showed me their demo of Spyro 4, Enter the Dragonfly, during my interview. And um, I already had pretty good admiration for the Spyro series from Insomniac. And... Um, this was the first Spyro that was going to come out for PlayStation 2, which was exciting new hardware at the time, and the demo they showed me looked really cool, so I was really excited. I thought this was exactly the kind of game I want to work on, uh, um, you know, a Twitch action game with, uh, with beautiful graphics and fun platforming puzzles, so the job seemed like a good fit for me, and I came out, and... Um, when I came to Check 6, we were working in an office in Venice, California, right on the border between Venice and Santa Monica on Main Street, um, which uh, in retrospect was um, a pretty swanky pad to be in, um, right by the beach, really nice area, and maybe not the uh, wisest choice for a location for a video game studio because I'm sure the rent was really high. We could have probably gotten an office um, somewhere much cheaper and not burned as much money. But it was a cool place to work because I could just walk to the beach whenever uh, I felt like it on, on lunch breaks and stuff. And we were sharing the office space with a company called Equinox. And as I recall, Check 6 was basically doing all the, the engineering for Spyro and Equinox was doing pretty much all the art, the animation and stuff. And these two companies were coexisting uh, happily, in theory, in the same office space. So I came in in March of 2002 and quickly learned that at that point the project had already been underway for quite some time. I think. Um, like about two years at that point and the producers at uh, Vivendi Universal had become quite concerned that um, the project was going to slip its release date uh, or maybe it already had slipped its release date um, and in any case uh, Universal convinced Check 6 to bring a bunch of new people on and, and get it done and get it done quick and that's why I was brought on but uh, I got to, uh, I, I met and I got to work with really cool uh, people there at the company, uh, great programmers like Jimmy Alaparambil, uh, John Bohorquez, Warren Davis. It was really hard work, but it was also a really uh, interesting experience and a, and a pretty cool way for me to start out my uh, game career. So on the project, my responsibilities included working on things like the movement of movement and behavior of Sparks, which was Spyro's sidekick, um, the AI and the animation of the Dragonfly NPCs, I did a lot of work on that, the Speedway games, um, and a lot of random stuff like the pre-game and the in-game menus, memory card management, user interface, bug fixes, I did a magazine demo and stuff like that. And I really busted on my butt on that project um, because, you know, we they were they were pushing us hard. Uh, like I said, the project was uh, was kind of in a urgent status, and they needed to get it done. And I remember uh, I didn't have a car at the time, so my only way to get to work was either to take the bus or later I got a, a bike. But um, there was one time where I had to get. Uh, something that I was working on done, it was pretty important, and I just didn't have enough time to get it done uh, when they needed it, and so my only choice was to just sleep overnight at the office, and I ended up sleeping there two, two nights in a row, and stayed there three days straight sleeping on their, on their sofa with uh, the cats that lived in that office, and I was alerted to cats, so that was, made it interesting too, but yeah, I really busted my butt on it. And uh, I think to to the credit of the team, we got it done. Got the game done in time for the holidays, 2002. Got it out the door. 
think we had to make a lot of sacrifices. I think the game wasn't what everybody wanted it to be. In my personal opinion, I don't think it, it quite lived up to um, the quality of the Insomniac Spyro games. I thought those were really slick, very polished, very well done games. I don't think our, our Spyro quite lived up to that. Although it was pretty. And uh, let's see. Yeah, I uh, I, I don't... It, it was many years ago, so I don't remember all the things that went wrong on the project. Um, I remember, uh, for whatever reason, um, the company had difficulty paying us. And... Uh, some paychecks were missed and or they fell behind on them and then later we got our paychecks but then it kept happening again and uh, in the end Chexic Studios still ended up owing me some money which I never saw but uh, you know that's all water under the bridge now uh, so there was some uh, some drama there but uh, I guess my my biggest personal disappointment about the project was just uh, in general um, the performance of the game. When I came in and I saw the demo of the game, they had it running at a really slick, sleek, beautiful 60 frames per second, and I'm a huge fan of, of running the game at, at 60 FPS or higher. Uh, so that really appealed to me, and that was also a much higher frame rate than any of the previous Spyro games had run at because, you know, they were made for the, the PlayStation 1, PSX hardly any games ran at 60 FPS on that. So I was I was really uh, pleased to see that. I was really gung-ho about it. But it didn't take long for me to realize that, um, that that wasn't really working out in reality in the project. And um, I think it's, I think it's uh, to some extent because uh, poor management, the, the artists were not given the direction and the tools that they needed to make sure that the assets they made could be rendered by our engine at 60 FPS and so we ended up with these assets that were too much for the hardware to push at 60 FPS but even more to the point we just didn't have the time to um, optimize anything and get it running faster and so uh, it wasn't long before I realized our target of 60 FPS uh, was changed and we were shooting for 30 FPS and, and then towards the end we uh, had even had a really hard time even keeping up with 30. So that was a huge disappointment to me. But uh, you know other than that I wasn't uh, I wasn't terribly unhappy with how it, how it came out. I think we worked really hard and, and, and came out with a pretty good product in the end, all things considered. The footage that has been playing in the background is an Enter the Dragonfly PS2 magazine demo made by Jason Fourier himself that included many differences that weren't in the final game, such as a much faster frame rate, an animation for dragonflies with unique particle effects, Spyro's hover having an actual sound effect, and a thump sound effect for when Spyro charged into a wall. It also contained an old version of the Atlas looking entirely different than the one used in the game, and finally, a smaller HUD for switching elements with beta graphics. In this demo, the only level players got to traverse in was Monkey Monastery. Many assets were missing, such as NPC voiceovers, only one breath sound effect playing, along with the sound you hear when vases break. Yeah, that's not that. The minigames weren't even complete in this demo, not even playable, and the end portal was replaced with a strange power-up gate not present in the final version of the game. One of the NPCs also had a misspelling of Spyro in their text. <sighs> what an error. I'm so surprised. Oh my god. Considering this was the build of the game that released only a month before the game was published, having all these problems and unfinished assets show that Check 6 and Equinox really had to grind in that last month of development to complete the game as much as possible. Honestly, it's actually really impressive how much they got done in that short space of time. Jason Furrier also told us that many unused assets were due to the producer on the game requesting changes just days until the game was shipped to Sony. He also stated that the art was mainly created by Equinox and was way too large for their engine to handle because Equinox was not given the proper tools. 
Jason was also reluctant to say much about what went on inside Check 6, but he did say many fights occurred inside the studio without mentioning names. Additionally, Nasty Nork was originally planned for the game as evidenced by multiple news outlets reporting on the game before it released. One thing almost nobody has ever realised about Enter the Dragonfly is that Nasty Nork still remains in the game, in the form of statues. Don't believe me? Well, take a look for yourself. Don't see it? Okay, how about now? Yeah, it's actually quite shocking how nobody has really noticed that after all these years. Nasty Nork was cut from the game in the later half of development, but isn't present because all the animation for cutscenes was completed in the last 20% of development. He was going to be alongside Ripto eventually battling Spyro. Additionally, the team only had two dialogue writers who weren't entirely experienced yet. One of them was literally just out of college. That definitely contributed to some luck. It's the cheese! Even if the game got its full development needed, the dialogue and plot still probably would have been as corny. Not that that's always a bad thing. Speaking of dialogue, there is a multitude of unused lines in the game's files. By speaking to Tim Yana Lunas, one of the scriptwriters, he revealed that due to rushed development, Moneybags was going to be written out of the Spyro series by stating he was just tired of gems. Have a listen. That's it. I've had it. I've had enough of dragons and dragonflies and gems. The gems! They're making me mad! Mad, I tell you, mad! I need a change! Gold. Yes, that's it. Gold! Curse these gems, they never get me anywhere! You take them, Spyro! You seem to be awfully fond of them anyhow. This is just one of over 40 unused voice clips in the files of the game. One unused piece of dialogue even references the bad programming the Bubble Breath contains. Anybody who has played Enter the Dragonfly knows how hard it is to catch dragonflies, so Check 6 thought they could make a joke to reference the development. Just too bad it didn't make it into the game. You've got to get close to him for the bubble breath to work. Of course, that's easier said than done. The unused dialogue even ranges from unused tutorials, just adding to the plethora of tutorials the game had. I'm sure Hunter got tired of constantly explaining to Spyro that he needed to press the X button to jump. Ugh. So check this out. If you press the triangle button while in the middle of a jump, You'll do a head bash that is great for breaking stuff open. Why don't you give it a try? Well, what do you know? I found a baby dragonfly. Why don't you add it to the collection? Yo, Spyro, it looks like you've activated your first breath ability. If you want to switch between your available breath abilities, just press the L1 button. You know, I heard that if you take a stone like that to the dragon statue over there, it will grant you a special power. Why don't you give it a try? Ain't dragon magic the best? You've got bubble breath now. You can use your bubble breath to capture any dragonflies running loose all over the world. Look, there goes a dragonfly now. Why don't you try using your ice breath? I bet it'll be more effective. Electric breath is the way to go. Try using it and we'll see what happens. There you go, Spyro! I knew you'd get it! Be sure to keep your friend Sparks the Dragonfly healthy, Spyro. If his health is low, flaming or charging fodder for butterflies is a good idea. Sparks loves butterflies. Uh-oh. It looks like another wave of battleships is on the way! Great job, Spyro! This dragonfly fell out of one of the airships and I caught it just in time. Why don't you take it? Oh no, the Riptox have rebuilt the factories. Can you destroy them again? Those Riptox won't be bothering us anymore. Here, I found another dragonfly in the wreckage. You know, if you grab one of them rocks on the ground, you can get the bees to buzz off by picking up one of the rocks on the ground and spitting on them. Is there any way to aim when I'm spitting rocks? You always come through, Spyro. Thanks for the help. Give it your best shot, twerp. So, it's up to you, and it's down to me. I'd say everything is up from where you stand, Shorty. Ever heard of Nasty Nork, the sorceress? Yeah, what about him? Imbeciles. And now you're about to join them. 
Boy, that guy doesn't know when to quit. You're very persistent for a little dragon. I'm also better than you. Wow! I knew we could do it! Well, Sparks, the Dragon Realms are safe again from Ripto. But I have a feeling he's not gone for long. Well, pal, off for a vacation once again. Where should we go this time? Back to Avalar? Frozen Altars? There are so many decisions ahead of us. Where should we start? Fun and son, here we come! Even Sparks was planned to give Spyro extra tutorials. Speaking of Sparks, he was even going to get new levels returning from the third game, though not much is known about these levels as they never left the conception stage. Also, a special release of Enter the Dragonfly included a music disc containing three unused tracks. The tracks being for the infamous cut level, Enchanted Forest, with Stuart Copeland naming the song Mid Flute for the main level, and its two minigames, Andes and Songa. Those two minigames in this level were going to require Spyro to flame a certain amount of gators in 30 seconds to earn a dragonfly, and secondly, picking up butterflies with sparks in a certain amount of time. Later investigation shows us that the scripting for these minigames was removed and replaced with a plain minigame as seen in Cloud9 and Monkey Monastery, and an unknown minigame. The Riptox had placed a giant tree on top of the porcupine's house and needed to be taken care of by Spyro. Even though Enchanted Forest didn't make it into the game, the spot where the NPC who would have taken you to the level still remains. It even includes a tree texture that the level would have contained. Just imagine a Scottish porcupine as confirmed by the game's original director Joel Goodsell standing right here taking Spyro to Enchanted Forest. Dialogue for the level remains, but it is not voiced. It even references old Spyro characters. Furthermore, in the manual of the game, an actual portal existed. This image has a very low resolution, but it is able to be made out. It's a portal that would take Spyro to their next homeworld because, as we've stated, the true vision for the game had over 25 levels. Now it is time to close off the early ideas, with several beta clips from IGN dating back from March 2002 to show a comparison to the final version.
Now that we have discussed all of the beta ideas, we should focus on the main reason the game is the way it is. We present the problems! The founder of Check 6, Brent Oster, was a damper on Enter the Dragonfly. Cutting the story short, he was fired due to... <clears throat> Attempted to kill someone by choking a programmer for disagreeing with him on a matter and having, quote, big mental problems. His head hit the window behind my head. At least nobody killed anybody, right? If Brent Oster is the Canadian I was talking about. He, he named the company Check Six. He was a little unstable. When things got really, really heated, he would snap. You know, he would fight with other people, Matt. And, you know, he was just mentally unstable and I didn't in interact with him directly too much but you know if you push him to a point I don't know what's wrong with the guy but he'll, he'll flip out he's mentally unstable and throws tantrums and then you know gets himself in deep trouble you know I mean look at that site I mean he can't form any plans he's not going anywhere obviously Matt Candler um, <laughs> Matt Candler is a pit bull he gets right in your face he doesn't back down at all and uh I don't, I don't know what to call it other than a white privilege or whatever, but, you know, he came from a well-off family, but he's not afraid to get into confrontations. He's definitely an alpha-type personality. He is fair. You know, even though he can be nasty, the thing about, um, I can't say anything really bad about Matt Candler. Um, he can be tough, he can be annoying, but he's, he's at least fair. If you, if, unless you screw up, you know, and, and deserve his wrath, uh, you're not going to get it. I never had a problem with Matt Candler, ever. In fact, when the company shut down, he called me up and he knew that um, John Mark Morell owed me money, so he said, come down and take everything that you could fit in your car. You hear this noise that you're hearing? That's one of the chairs I got from that. <laughs> I still have it 15 years later. Yeah, well, it's a, it's a $2,000 hair on chair. Common joke that was going around the team is like, uh, what was the phrase Brian Reed coined that I thought was brilliant? <laughs> oh, when creativity brings big money, it gets risky to be creative. At the time, Saji was like, he was starving. You know, he couldn't even afford to buy food. He was sitting up, a, up against the monitor, you know, because I was asking, why are you sitting so close to the monitor? Because, you know, he's like sitting 10 inches away from the monitor looking at his screen and trying to do work and uh, trying to build out his levels and script things. What happened was is he ran out of, uh, he couldn't even afford to buy saline solution anymore, so his contact lenses dried up and died. I just started taking him out to lunch and just accidentally, because he was so proud, he would never accept money from anybody else, so I just started going out and said, dude, just come along with me, I'm just gonna go grab a drink or whatever. And I would accidentally buy him a hamburger and things like that. I decided to feed him, he was eating out of a giant bucket of peanut butter, and that's how bad it got. You know, when your employees are eating peanut butter to keep from starving, you got a problem. I had the IRS call me up and asking me if they needed to be armed to confront, you know, uh, John Rock Morell and Jack Malias and those guys. Universal rejected a lot of content. They were really nitpicking, and um, they were to prove something and send, and send, you know, concept and renders. And the Vendy would give a green light, and then when the level is done, or almost completely done, then they would reject it. Baked Alaska? I don't know what level it was in terms of sequence, because the sequences were always changing, but um, it was a lot, it is, it's basically, um, Alaska was turned into a desert, and that's why it's called Baked Alaska. So it was, a, it was kind of a desert kind of environment. It looked beautiful, and it had a lot of really cool layout and design and what have you. Baked Alaska was um, a very, very painful cut to the team because they, the team liked that one. Uh, the lead designer especially, I think it was the last straw for him because that one was, it was, I liked the layout of that one. I can't remember enemies in love and what have you. It was just the layout. It was the vibe. It had a really good vibe. It was, you know, it looked like a, it looked like Bugs Bunny and Coyote, you know, it looked like a Roadrunner, very Warner Brothers-esque to it, and it had a really, it, had, it was really attractive. It's an attractive level. I do remember areas of like, you know, red, red waterfalls and water and everything else. The problem was is that the original concept of the game was that the game was a linear experience. And for some reason, the Vendi Universal did not like the level designs to be linear. They wanted to be circular like Mario. They argued that all of the spiral levels before were circular and not linear. 
problem was is that con the, the technology was never designed to support that at the technological level in terms of what they call uh, levels and sub-level loading and what have you. So they had sub-level systems, and the way the code worked is that the game could only go straight forward. If you went back across sub-levels, like I can crash that game at will to this day if I come across it. You go across three sub-levels, come back to move forward one, hard crash. Because the same technology also drove um, Aliens Colonial Marines, and that's why it crashed in E3 and they pulled it down. I lost count after six or seven, but I know that the, the uh, GDD was rewritten, you know, six or seven times. You know, I mean completely, 300 pages each. The, pr the publisher demanded GDD work, and I mean, that, that requires somebody to sit there and rewrite the whole thing. You know, for politics. And the way the contract was written is that if... And the contract was written very poorly, unfortunately. So if the publisher didn't like anything, they would just withhold payment and the whole team would starve. Check 6 itself was doing a lot of shady things. So, um, like, they they canceled everyone's insurance without telling them, except for the leads. Um, so, like, there was um, a technical art director, Alex. Awesome dude. I'm not going to say anything bad about him. But he had, his wife was pregnant with twins. They're not going to cancel his health insurance without telling him. They canceled mine. I had cut my hand on, on a piece of glass and I had to get 17 stitches. I found out the hard way that my health insurance was canceled. So the emergency room came after me later, you know, and, uh, and I didn't know this. So I didn't, you know, I didn't, I moved. So they still were sending mail to my old address. So it went to collections and my credit started going down and then all of a sudden a $1,500 bill goes up to 7,000. And um, John Mark Morell told me to go screw myself, take him to small claims. There was an artist in the early, late 90s. And she was at the top of her game. Her name was Ilea. She was in the movie Queen of the Damned. And um, she was a vampire queen at that. And she also did a lot of, she was a hip hop artist much at the top of her game. Kind of like a young Beyonce, but skinny, kind of just kind of at the top of her game and kind of coming up. Everything she touched turned to gold. She died in a plane crash. <laughs> you know, her plane was overloaded at the end of a runway and went off the end of a runway and crashed and burned. And her and her entire production crew died because the producer was you know, demanding they put all the equipment in one plane. All died. Well, that production crew was above us at check six. So... I remember I used to complain because we had open open ceilings, you know, with open wooden ceilings. You could look up and see the raptors. And there was somebody walking around with wooden sandals, you know, that are just like, God damn it, I just wish they would die in a fire. A week later, they fucking do. I'm burning in hell for that one. I just had to share that with you. In fact, I was just trying to save the title from being canceled. Well, Ricky Ruccavina's feedback was not helpful at all. He would just say, that's not Spyro. One of my favorites, uh, Chris Masterton, he and John Mark Morell clashed immediately. He called John Mark Morell out on his BS. And John Mark Morell responded in kind, so Chris Masterson promptly quit. He did it the most spectacular way, and he didn't waste any time. Uh, Matt Candler was professional about it as much as he could be, but he didn't really get along with Chris Masterton only because Chris Mas Masterton which just kind of lumped everybody in the same pile. You're all you're all full of crap. I'm not playing this game. He came and collected his uh, last paycheck and loudly, well, as he walked out, he just loudly said, "So long, fuckers," and walked out the door. Um, and we were all just like, "God, I wish I didn't have any bills to pay." <laughs> just... Fired or not, Brent was the original founder of the company, so every single decision for Check Six made had to be signed by Brent to make it happen. This caused a lot of time problems, as Brent wasn't very willing to work with the people that fired him. Lawyers were involved in this matter as well, and caused a large portion of Enter the Dragonfly's budget to be spent on lawyer fees, eventually causing Check 6 to cease to exist. Even after the massive cluster Spyro 4 was, another game was in the works, but ended just like Aliens Colonial Marines. Having a founder like Brent Oster is already a big problem, but an even bigger problem is how almost the entirety of Equinox spoke Japanese. Communication was rare between Equinox and Check 6, causing many fights to break out that really didn't end so well. 
Just imagine if the game was actually finished, allowing even more fights and problems to occur. Anyway, we also have a video interview with Frank, who worked on Spyro's particle effects. He only worked on the game for two weeks because the conditions at Check 6 were so terrible, he dreaded going to work every day. He barely remembers anything about the game, but he did recall one thing. Check 6 was a very messed up company back then, and lots of conflicts in general, not, this, not on this project, but on, in general at the company level. Lots of, you know, top level people quitting or being fired, you know. Um, didn't help with the stability of the company. The, the company doing the art, uh, which was, I can't remember their name. Anyway, uh, they got into a fight with Chick Six as well. So, you know, there was a little, <laughs> it's just, it was not a happy place. <laughs> just put it this way. Uh, that's also one of the reasons I quit because you know, when you work that hard and, you know, uh, at least it has to be somewhat of a happy place and it was. Baked Alaska wasn't the only cut level, there were over 15 more, but with the growing list of problems at Check 6, levels were cut right and left, leaving the final game with only 8 levels. If you thought that the problems were over, you'd be wrong, because we've only just begun. Programmers and other devs of Check 6 left notes in the files of the game, particularly threats and arguments they just didn't care to delete. After knowing Brent's history on the game, it adds an extra eerie feeling reading these as Brent could have been the one to write some of them. Moving on from Frank, a producer named Eveline from Check 6 and Universal elaborated on the problems. Eveline also seemed to be very upset to talk about her past at Check 6 and was angered that it was brought back up again even after telling us we should call her. From cussing at us to telling us we had nothing better to do, this just shows the negativity associated with Spyro 4. I actually was the last producer on it. I basically hired a new team. I was basically more involved in making sure things happened, making sure, you know, everybody was on track, making, you know, sitting through um, the bills, making sure bugs were followed, um, bugs were closed. Um, you know, it's, it's really producer I kept working together and, um, you know, ultimately that's the communication because I had worked for Universal previously, so I knew everybody at Universal. What's your role? You know, I'm, I'm sure that there were a lot of lofty ideas and lofty goals and lofty, you know, uh, just, and also you try a lot of things and it actually, you know, once you have it, once you build it, once you realize it's not so much fun, then it's, you adjust it. So, um, you know, so it's, there was a lot of that a lot of, oh, um, kind of lack of clarity and like, oh, let's try these things. And, um, you know, then it's um, without thinking, okay, we're going to try these things and, uh, you know, development is development. And you have to also account for how long it's going to take and, you know, think things through. And, uh, you know, sometimes I think there's a lot of like blue sky ideas that people come up with where it's like, okay, it's really going to work. It's also very different, what I've found is also very different when you have how relationships work. And it was it was a, also uh, just through the different people, the different groups, and how all that. Ultimately, a developer is paid by a publisher, and if publishers delay the milestones by months and months, where I remember that was, that, that was one when I was there, and it was just complete bullshit, where I basically, um, you know, I basically told John Mark, you overstep the line, you go directly to Jim Wilson, and you say, this is not happening, these guys are not paying, um, and this is taking longer, then we're going to stop development. I also know that, you know, some people blacked off, and some people weren't doing the work. Universal was just 
I was amazed. I was amazed. I, you know, I came from Activision. I came from organized development. The bullshit that I saw going on at Universal was just amazing. As far as just overall, it was just amazing. So it comes from the top down. Frankly, you know, a developer does what they're told, ultimately. I mean, Universal owned the license. Universal approved that. So as far as I'm concerned, I, I went in and finished the game. Helped get it done. And then um, after that, um, you know, check six pretty much. There, were, there was another project and then the company got um, sold. What are you, uh, what, what's your role? Then maybe I don't really need to give you more information. Because you seem to have spent many, you know, a long time doing the research. Oh my god, um, again, I don't know. Why did you bring this up? That's so strange. Hey, what's, your, um, what's your role? Why are you calling 20 years and digging up shit? Don't you have anything better to do with yourself? I do. Hopefully you have the time to waste to do that. Oh, but you know what? Um, honestly, then go do your research elsewhere. Why dig up shit from 20 years ago? I'm like, I'm not, I, you know, I've been in the fashion industry for the last 15 years. I'm like, you know, what the hell? <laughs> it's just, I, it, you, it's amazing. I'm like, you after this call with her, she sent this lovely text. Oh, just such an absolutely incredible woman. I've never met someone kinder, truly. Just, she's the kind of grandmother gives you kisses and makes you just all warm and fuzzy, you know? That kind of woman. By contacting Randolph once again, we got even more details, including more problems with Check 6, cut content, as well as very shocking details about Evelyn. You want to hear this off the record? You know who that is? I know exactly who that is. That is Evelyn Morell. Mark Morell's ex-wife, they divorced. As a result, I think he's stranded in Taiwan, last I heard. His wife divorced him and Activision sent him over to China and then they fired him while he was there. He'll say he quit, but they fired him, so... She is responsible for weaseling a deal between Vivendi Universal and Check Six Studios to get the Spyroom deal. Because she worked at Vivendi Universal. However, Vivendi, Vivendi Universal is insanely political and they ate her alive. If you mention my name to, to Evelyn, she will go nuclear. She hates me because I quit. I was lead designer and the publisher loved me. They loved me. Well, she will defend him because she's implicated. She'll go to prison. If any of that kind of crap comes back, you know, they'll, you know, uh, they aren't gonna sh talk about stuff like that because, you know, the IRS would come after them. She's up there in stability with, um, Brian Oster. Yeah, so you can imagine what it was like to be in a room full of them. Yeah, you might want to be careful going forward. Ready for some fun facts that have never seen the light of day? The first level that went into development was Monkey Monastery, followed by Crop Circle Country. The ladder texture was reused in Cloud9 as a design on the machines that shoot the dream beams. Bartholomew was supposed to be the NPC taking Spyro to Monkey Monastery, but was replaced, although Bartholomew is still the one talking. Great job, young dragon! That should be enough. Thank you, Spyro! The dragon statue that grants Spyro his powers was originally brown and had a different design along with the ability stones also being brown. By accident, a programmer deleted the model for the pink gem a couple weeks before the game released, making it appear yellow in the final game. Check 6 is called Check 6 because there were 6 co-founders of the company. It doesn't just mean check your 6. Luau Island originally had a dragonfly chest, but it was later moved to Monkey Monastery with no design change. By searching among the depths of the internet and by using the Wayback Machine, we were able to find many lost pieces of media from Vivendi's website and IGN's early look they had at the game that revealed a never-before-seen beta logo for Enter the Dragonfly. Sparks has three bits of dialogue in cutscenes, but without captions. Until now. Here's what he says. Oh, 
Producer on Spyro 2, 3 and 4 loved karate and dojo, so he came up with Bamboo Terrace for Year of the Dragon, as well as Dragonfly Dojo for Spyro 4. The monkey statues in Monkey Monastery were originally golden. The beta dragonflies flew up and down as they bounced off the ground, making them even harder to catch than the final version. Major geometry changes happened pretty much last minute with Crop Circle Country and Jurassic Jungle, causing major sections of the level to be changed or cut entirely. Sparks had many different models throughout the game's development, including being purple and having big bug eyes. Two music tracks exist outside of the cut free for Enchanted Forest, but it's hard to hear, especially the second track. that was it? Nope! By piecing the first two clips together and a very hard to access music file inside the game titled Pirates, we can get a much better listen to this track. Let's enhance the audio. We can tell this was going to be used within a level called Cutthroat Cove, due to the name Pirates matching the theme of the level. Cutthroat Cove, Baked Alaska, and Enchanted Forest are currently the only three levels that got extremely far in development. We will share many new details about these levels later in the documentary. As for the other music track, that would have likely been an additional minigame in either Cutthroat Cove or Baked Alaska, although we can barely enhance it. Skyboxes, enemies, level designs, and animations were always constantly changing, and that really shines through in the beta footage and trailers.
Thieves Den was originally going to be a completely upside down level, as the wizard enemies were planned to cast a magic spell causing Spyro to traverse the level upside down, which sounds really cool by the way. The Riptock Wizards have turned our den upside down! Our own treasure is running away from us! Take care of the Riptock Wizards and meet me at the end of the tunnel! The mouse NPC from Jurassic Jungle wore glasses, had a pencil and a notebook. In other words, all props that the Professor would have used if they had enough time to add him into the game. The Tiki Drumming minigame uses an early version of Jurassic Jungle's main theme because they needed an extra track and didn't have one. <laughs> A glitch only very few people have ever discovered, known as the Pooping Cow Glitch, was actually a collision test developer Andrew Taju left in the game. By interviewing him, he told us that the game's tests were done in the hub world, specifically near the castle door. Spyro 4 was originally announced on February 19th, 2002, at the first annual games fair in France. Ripto's boss battle and arena were all created in just over a week. Top Circle Country's NPCs share the exact same idle and talking animations as Jurassic Jungle's NPC. Enough with the drama. Nah, just kidding. Let's bring back Randolph! Let the new info drop in 3, 2, 1! I relocated and they were first on Washington Boulevard near Via Marina and whatever that is in that area in Venice. And, uh,. That was a nice location, but it was too small, and then we moved over to the spot on Main Street, and that's when shit went downhill fast. And that entire crew was messed up. I mean, Jack Mamias, he went to a strip club, and a freaking stripper got into his head. Jack Mamias was an alcoholic at one point. I mean, I'm not, I don't mean to talk shit about him, but because he got clean and sober, he's good now, he teaches. But at one point, he was pretty fucked up. You know, he got involved with a stripper. While he was away at work, she pretended to be drunk and passed out, woke up, went through stuff, and managed to sign his entire house over to her. He came home, and he couldn't get into his own house anymore, legally. <sighs> that was pretty bad. There's some guys that just lose their mind when they get with a girl, so he's one of them. Uh, when he talks, he talks a good game around everybody else and how badass he is, but, you know, this, this... And this, this girl did this in, like, less than a month. Like, wow. <laughs> that's wow. Now that's why I say, like, sometimes you have people, just because they're talented and skilled, doesn't mean they're mature, or they can actually handle it, or that they didn't get, you know, because like I said, sometimes there's nothing meaner than an old nerd who got us to spend his entire childhood getting his ass kicked by jocks out of the bike rack, and when he finally makes a six-figure salary, he turns into a tyrant, he or she. That happens a lot. I, I hired this team, and I told them what I want, and they did exactly what I wanted, and that's why it didn't work. I need you to argue with me. We need to. We need that creative process to go around in circles until we refine the idea. I cannot complete a creative idea on my own. We need the magic between us to happen. That's why we're so good with each other. And a lot of times people forget that, and they argue for themselves, instead of for what is best for the target audience. We have a combination of greed at the, cover, at the uh, publisher level, and you have a bit of dysfunction at the developer level, where people care more about um, winning an argument than working together to create a vision. You're not gonna get anywhere. I'm gonna die a painful death, and it's like every studio. That's really what breaks my heart, is sometimes I'll go and get, you know, I'll go and work at a studio, and they're still stuck on that crap. Stuff that I saw back in the 90s or 2000s. Human nature doesn't evolve all the time. You have to actually grow a team and have that team mature as a team. Unfortunately, a lot of studio heads and publishers just think, you know, we have the license, we can hire anybody anytime we want, it'll still work. It doesn't work. You have to have that collective magic with the entire team. Every game that shows up at E3 is usually a promise that may or may not be there when the game ships. Because a lot of times you have to actually create a build specifically for E3. And sometimes, you know, like you hear this term called vertical slice, 
and a vertical slice means we have it's feature complete, not content complete. There's some features that take an entire year to develop. Uh, to do that on a team is is really painful, especially to the programmers. That's why programmers are so grouchy all the time. Yeah, so it's uh, and then you have technical art directors and art directors and everybody else that gets involved in trying to whip up some vision, you know, and it, it's. And when you go behind the scenes of a publisher, you find out why all these things happen. The developers usually love the games. The most of the people at the publishing level that are directly interfacing with the developers love the games. But sometimes you go higher up and you get into the financial area, the marketing area, or the corporate area, the executive area. They don't care. It's just another business to them. And it's just another game, and it has to make you know a certain amount of money. And they care more about their portfolio of games and are they hitting all of the different spaces in the market that's when profit becomes more important than the player you have to remember this this is a very 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 painful development cycle a lot of bitter feelings bad blood and bad memories imagine a dev cycle being two and a half years long you know and um being that you ever played world of warcraft there's the entry level and the order uh the orc side the horde side um, the starting area, you know, it all takes place in this landscape called Durotar, and there's, you know, everything is all sandy and dirty and what have you. Um, that art direction is very similar to base baked Alaska, so it was an oxymoron of basically hot and cold. These levels were well designed and well thought out. I put a big portion of it on um, Vivendi Universal. I mean, they were so hung up on shipping World of Warcraft. Uh, the developer didn't have dev kits for a long time, um, and then when they did actually start paying attention to the product, they couldn't. They weren't happy with anything, and they couldn't be made happy. They just kept saying, "That's not Spyro. That's not Spyro." Well, guess what? We know the people that worked on Spyro. We have barbecues with them every fucking weekend. We know them better than you do. Explain to us what you're talking about, and they wouldn't do it. And the developer, you know, because I knew Ted Price, I knew. Uh, Matt Whiting, I've known for a long time. He says that's why we don't work with Vivendi Universal anymore. <laughs> we did three games with them, and that's it. No, actually four, because he did Disruptor before. That was their their launch title. I know he wouldn't approve of it. I know none of them would ever be like, yeah, wow, well, you know, because all of them would just say that is pure shit. Uh, there's no doubt in my mind that yeah, none of them would ever say anything good about Spyro. It isn't that good of a game. It's actually pretty crappy. PS2 is capable of way more, but um, again, we were limited by art direction because they were afraid to go too far away from PS1. You remember what I said? Creativity, big money, and all that. That's you know they were worried about alienating. You know I said, well, why don't you just get? All you have to do is become higher definition with the graphics. You don't have to change your art direction. That doesn't mean. Anything. By the time I was just trying to lead the damn game to a, com- a completion. There had been so many changes, and there's been so much content that had been just written off. I couldn't even begin to describe how much content had been written off. Because I know that, like, a lot of the team members were like, you know, we could have made five Spyros with the amount of content we've deleted for this game. They were with the amount of rejected content, I should say, because the rejection rate was basically 80% of all the content we submitted. And they would ask for it. They would sit there and say, "We want this, these changes," and then they would just reject the, the content entirely. So they would sit there and say, "Well, we want a waterfall. Now we don't want a waterfall." Things like that, and they don't really understand that you know you're burning the candle at both ends doing this kind of crap. I think I remember a Sparks mini game. Yeah, top down. <laughs> I, it was one of these things where Sparks went off and did her own thing for a minute and then came back. I just remember the green grass, the green textures underneath, top down view. You know. Shooting lightning or something out of it or whatever. I can't remember too much about it, but I, I do re- vaguely recall there being a Sparks mini game. And in general, I am not a fan of mini games when the core vision is broken. You know, fix the core game, get the core vision, understand what you want to do there. Then you can get fancy with like extraneous crap. If you don't have a cohesive vision to begin with, why come up with mini games? But you're being kneecapped when somebody destroys your core vision constantly, and then they demand mini games on top of it because everybody else has one. Ember, yep, yeah, that sounds familiar. Well, I think she was going to be like a turret that flew alongside Spyro. I can't remember. Vague, I can only remember vague, 
you know, there was a thing where she would fly along, Spyro would do turrets and be part of like puzzle solving within certain areas. But again, you know, it, it just one of these things where the design got was too inconsistent, or the vision was too inconsistent, and we couldn't put her in. You know, there's no point in putting her in if, uh, you know, we keep having to change the design and we can't stabilize the design to create a reason for her to exist. Because a lot of times they, uh, the, the publisher always gets all acts, all of the game assets at the end of a development cycle, usually. So in this case, they got all the assets and they're like, cool, <laughs> we want the next developer to do this. She was a turret, like she would be flying alongside Spyro, but it was kind of redundant because you have sparks, you know, why sparks can do that too, big deal. Or it was one of those things where why would you have, why would you toggle between uh, Spyro and her you know, because you have to write her into the design, write her into the story, create a reason for her to be there, and then come up with puzzles for her to solve specific to her abilities. We couldn't even agree on what the heck Spyro was doing. Or not, well, the develop the publisher couldn't agree, because we kept, you know, they kept changing it. They kept changing the scope, or the, well, I mean, that's what happens. The scope of the game goes gets smaller every time you make a design change while you're in production. The general rule is, is that you should have your vision and your design and everything solidified before you begin your production run. I was pulled aside by Matt Cameron and says, look, we can afford to lose I mean, Aliens, Colonial Marines, but we can't afford to lose Spyro. If we lose Spyro, we lose the company. So uh, we just lost Brian Reed. We lost Joe Goodsell. There's a lot of legal warfare back and forth. There's, this is a bad project, man. I mean, it was really bad. A lot of people don't want to relive these memories, man. I mean. This one hurt me forever. It still hurts me. So, yeah, this is like one of the worst scenarios. Because, I mean, I'll, that's how I kept the I kept the team going by just simply saying, I know you guys aren't getting paid, but if we get this game out the door, it's fucking Spyro, guys. It's fucking Spyro. If we get this thing out the door, we will make it up on the back end. And not only that, other publishers will come to us. You know, things will happen. We just have to get this thing up, running, looking good. So Ari Richmond and Sean Rowe were Equinox. And they had all of their talent, you know, because they were basically just um, an outsourcing studio or a stateside um, art house. And they worked on basically commercials and movie content. And it's basically just art. And that's why they prioritize art above gameplay. So if I gave them a level design that was all mocked up, right? And I just said, hey, this is ready to go to final art. I just need these pathways clear so the player can do what they need to do. And they would fuck it up. Say, I don't like it. It looked, it looked more, it looked, you know, for aesthetic reasons, they change it. And then it breaks the game design. And then when you go to complain to them, they'll say they can't speak English. There was a shit combo platter all over the place. From the publisher all the way down to the front desk. You might see cracks in the geometry here and there. You might see hiccups in the animation, things like that when you go over a sub-level because you're you're transferring because it's what is called portal technology. You're only looking at what you, what you look at is what the game renders, but they do it in chunks, chunks of memory. Another point to bring up is due to the glitches that occurred in the game, a four-year-old boy had a seizure, resulting in Vivendi getting sued and the mother seeking higher legal action. Although it is shocking that only one case of seizures was documented, considering how bad some glitches got in Enter the Dragonfly. You've heard the beta ideas, as well as the problems. As they say, third time's the charm! Let's explore the consequences. Time to see what unfolded as a result of Spyro Enter the Dragonfly. Three additional games were in the works at Check 6, those being an untitled Tomb Raider game, a mummy game based on the cartoon at the time, and of course, Aliens Colonial Marines. Cutting the company health insurance and starving multiple developers was a telltale sign the company was bound to collapse, but after Enter the Dragonfly was shipped, they began work on that mummy game only to abandon it several weeks down the line. But more importantly, Spyro 4 obliterated a legend. 
Everyone always thought that Check 6 and Equinox were lazy, but they went above and beyond to follow Universal's demands, structuring all levels in a circle, constantly changing character designs, mechanics, graphics, making Spyro play like the originals with just a few new breath abilities. All things Check 6 did not want to do. Check 6 had a new vision for the franchise, an older teenage Spyro who had breath abilities based on elements and could freeze and climb waterfalls, all whilst exploring unique level designs and environments, but instead Universal took over and almost destroyed the Spyro franchise. Now it's my turn! Check 6 would have made another Spyro game if the company wasn't so broke. However, this was probably for the best, as Universal found Eurocom and Traveller's Tales not too long after Check 6's collapse. Passing off concepts and of course Ember to the new developers, Spyro A Hero's Tale released in November of 2004, exactly two years after Enter the Dragonfly. As many people know, this new Spyro was a new take on the franchise, causing the Spyro series to lose its image even further. Spyro's voice, controls, concepts, and overall gameplay were shifted to attempt to rebirth the series. But despite the game not being too bad, it, uh, spoiler alert, didn't really work out at all. Twice. Ah, uh, well, three times. Thankfully, the fourth time it worked. I absolutely have nothing against the Hero's Tale or Skylanders, but it's not exactly classic Spyro. As for the developers of Spyro 4, many moved on to Activision, THQ, Disney, or even Insomniac Games, with many of them creating their own companies and startups, never reaching the amount of success they had on Enter the Dragonfly. Almost half of Check 6 and Equinox denied our request to communicate, saying they had forgotten, they had to keep their mouths shut, or the project was just so bad they didn't want to talk about it. These people were just normal people at the end of the day. They wanted to create something that we and they would love, but clearly weren't allowed. Vivenvi went on to publish Rushed Game after Rushed Game, becoming defunct on July 10th, 2008, just as Check 6 and Equinox had prior. Those Rushed Games included The Legend of Spyro Trilogy, Crash the Wrath of Cortex, and Crash to Insanity. The carelessness Universal had with Spyro and Crash led to the death of Spyro and, of course, killed Crash Bandicoot. But that's fur another day. In short, this game was not rushed in a traditional sense. When mentioned to Check 6, they laugh at the thought of the game being rushed. Before this documentary, nobody knew exactly when development began for this game, but now we can tell you that development began in the range of January and February of 2000, which means over an entire two and a half years were spent on the game from start to finish, with many all-nighters occurring on top of that. Development on the engine began in Texas shortly before early 2000 and even continued as the company moved twice to California before settling on Main Street. The stress Check 6 was put under made many members quit game development entirely. Three fourths of this game were cut, as evident by Enchanted Forest, Baked Alaska, and Cutthroat Cove. Yes, you heard that right. We have exclusive info on yet another never before heard of level known as Cutthroat Cove. The music previously featured was actually meant for this level, as the name Pirates fits this level perfectly. Ricky Rukavina, who produced and even helped design the five Spyro games after the original Spyro the Dragon, had some peculiar details to share about Spyro 4's development. However, he was quite reluctant on the entire topic of Enter the Dragonfly, and even changed the topic to Skylanders, the GBA Spyro games, as well as asking where we live for some reason. I believe I was creative director back then. I'm just private. It, it, it kind of wouldn't matter what game. I started on, on Spyro 2, Rift Desert Rage, and then went through that, and then went through Year of the Dragon, and all the GBA games. I forget what else. This is kind of why I don't like to talk about stuff, because I feel like already it's off to a start where there's like disparaging people, and I'm just not into that. I mean, I don't think I have much to add. My um, memory's not that great anyways, to be honest. <laughs> it never has been. So, I just, I don't think I, I have anything to add. I think at the time, I remember we wanted to do a contiguous world, and we didn't have the time. You know, I thought that would be cool. The Dragonfly idea came because we had done something in GBA, and it was kind of riffing off of the baby dragons. Near the Dragon, and Near the Dragon was funny, Enter the Dragon 5 was just, you know, I was kind of a Kung Fu fan, martial arts fan, hence my company now, Kung Fu Factory. I thought Enter the Dragon 5 was a fun game, and that sort of is how the Dragonflies became the collectible in the game. 
I thought that would be fun and cute and sort of within spiral traditions. I'm sure there's a bunch of stuff cut out. It's just so long ago. You know, making a game, you know, or any project, there's there's always kind of ups and downs and push and pull. I, I'd suspect I'd be willing to kind of go in if I knew there was a bunch of other people doing it. It's sanctioned by Activision and Insomniac and everybody was cool. Like, you know, then I'd probably be open to talking more. I say, like, let the game be what it is. And, um, you know, I'd say find somebody with a better memory than me. Even games I've recently made, I really don't remember a lot of, about them because I just like to kind of move on to new new stuff and experiences. All right, well, look, you know, I wanted to at least call back and just sort of say, you know, hey, and shoot well and finding everything out and all that kind of stuff. But, you know, I promise, I, I just, I don't have a lot of information and I don't know. Like I said, I mean, I don't love... Like rehashing the past in ways is just not my thing. I'm just not out there and kind of talking publicly, typically either. So this is me. You know, it's just one of those things that I don't know if people really want to talk about it. Not if anybody's authorized to talk about it. That's why I would encourage you to. I don't know. Where do you Where do you live? In Chicago? Or what What other than their games do you like to play? Did you like Skylanders? I thought Skylanders. Did you like it? And what about, um, did you play any of the GBA games, Aspire GBA games? What other kind of projects do you have like that you're working on? It's one of those things where, you know, when we when you work for a big company like Universal, Activision, all that stuff, like, when you, like, probably part of the reason people don't want to talk is, you know, we sign all kinds of stuff and they don't want us talking about anything. Like, regardless, I don't have that great of a memory anyways so you know i don't remember much of that time i barely remember who i worked with um because you know i worked on a bunch of things at that time and like you know the developers kind of it's kind of like what i do now right the developers typically in charge and make a lot of the decisions no different than insomnia or naughty dog they're they're in charge and kind of their vision for the game right so but that being said, it's, there's typically uh, publishers that, you know, you sign NDAs, all kinds of stuff. My guess would be that it probably was, but that nobody has any idea it, it, where it is, and or it was, it could have been thrown away. Like I don't know for sure. I have no idea. But just because it's changed hands so many times, when I was there, there was no really good way of storing things. You would just basically get an archive and you'd give it to, you know, somebody in the um, in, uh, QA, but like the tech department, you know, and, and they would, you just give it to them and that was that. And so who knows, and then those people have probably gone, come and gone a bunch of times. There's probably nothing anymore. I do remember um, Crap Circle Country, that was one of the first levels built. If you look it into the Dragonfly and, and maybe Spyro 2, a lot of the levels have like, you know, are named and then they, then the, the second word is like country. There's like kind of a theme going on, so that theme was helped dictate a lot of the, the names for the levels that the, the designers would come up with. Team Monastery was the first one. And then Craft Circle Country, I think, was second. There were supposed to be other levels. Like, you know, I'm sure they were cut pretty short, just because, uh, you know, that I do remember that it, it, uh, they wanted it out for the holidays. By knowing that Ricky is the main reason the game became what it was in the end, it is reasonable to say that this could be why he never talks about Spyro. It's almost like the former CEO of Vivendi Universal doesn't want to admit to all his past wrongdoings, and even being very responsible for the decline of the franchise, by of course trying to change the subject with questions and abruptly hanging up. People seem to really want to see cut textures from all of the removed levels. While it may not be exactly what you want, we are still proud to reveal something nobody has ever noticed that has been right in plain sight after all these years. Take a look at these images. Do you notice anything out of the ordinary?
These chests were not meant to be in these three levels. They were designed for three other very special levels. Honey Marsh's chest was made for Enchanted Forest, and contains three assets of the cut level. Thieves Den's chest was meant for Baked Alaska, with an icy and black desert-like look to it. And finally, Jurassic Jungle's chest was made for a very secretive cut level, Cutthroat Cove, as you can tell from the skull and the overall pirate look. If just telling you that these chests were from those cut levels isn't enough, the scripting in the files even states this very thing. Wouldn't you love a detailed description of each cut level with details you wouldn't find anywhere else? After all this research, all these months, all these phone calls and messages, there's still more to discover. The story of Spyro Enter the Dragonfly is not over, and it likely won't ever be. It's up to the community to truly discover the remaining details about the game. So many concepts, problems, and cut content still lie dormant. There are things we won't release due to this. For anyone still interested in finding new cut content, look at the game's textures. Dragon Realms alone has over 60 unused textures. But sadly, after over 16 years, nobody has put forth the effort to discover all of this until this very documentary. Of course, some people have looked at the files and made theories about what happened. We hope that in the future people will look into games they like if they truly want to know what went on in development. It has brought many positive and interesting aspects from the past to life. We've learned what went on in Check 6 Equinox offices, what the developers thought about the game, cut content, whether it be cut levels, sound effects, story changes, footage, screenshots, even stories of developing the game, and much, much more. While those aspects have been positive, it's clear that the negatives outweigh the positives. As well as all the developer phone call conversations we've shown you, there have been many, and I mean many, messages exchanged over LinkedIn with people who just wanted to talk over texts. Here's a highlight of some of the most interesting messages we've had with developers of Spyro 4.
A man named Warren Davis helped create the arcade classic Cubert, but years later worked at Check 6. He was responsible for programming Crop Circle Country's UFO Cow minigame, as well as designing multiple others. Warren also helped with a variety of other things at the company, including being the sole reason for the game even being published in the end. Luckily, we managed to share a conversation with him. The only things that I did design, and this was very late in the, in the process when we were sort of scrambling to finish the game, were some mini games. Just again, trying to flesh out and add things at the last minute. And, and a lot of the stuff I was implementing was generic. After I left Check 6, Check 6 and Equinox had split. It did go to work for Equinox for a while. I haven't looked at that game or played that game since it was released. Believe me, I moved on to other things and put it behind me. I think I have some old design documents in a box somewhere. As I recall, we did not have access to Insomnia at all. And, and as far as I knew and as far as I was told, they were not available to us as uh, resources. Because we asked. I mean, that was... <laughs> That would have been an important thing for us to have access to the original programmers. It was a difficult experience. I don't think there was a lot of pride, you know, in, in how things turned out. Everybody just wanted to move on. I mean, Joel especially, Joel, Joel was the designer. You know, he had great ideas and grand ideas and he had a real vision for what the potential was for this game. And, you know, he, he was frustrated because he wasn't allowed to see that to fruition. It was a case of Universal, who owned the property, signed off on a deal to have Check 6 develop this game. And there was a design in place that they signed off on, or at least they, they signed a contract that said, yes, we want you to develop this game. But then once we were in production, the design kept changing. It's like they couldn't make up their mind what they wanted. That's a, not a good thing to happen during the development of a game, to have to constantly be changed. You know, you set uh, milestones and you set schedules based on a game's design, and, and you say, this is what we have to do. And then all of a sudden, the people who are writing your paychecks are saying like, yeah, let's throw that out, let's put this in, let's just keep changing it. Their engine was, I would say, not developed enough for Universal to come in and say, sure, we, we like what we see as far as your proof of concept. We're going to trust in you that you can deliver the game. Trust is a big word there because uh, they didn't really have a track record and they didn't really have an engine that could deliver. So the onus was on the, the guys writing the engine that could be a foundation for the game we wanted to make, but it didn't exist when they signed the contract. They, they had to really continue to work on that and get there. And, you know, there's no reason to believe they wouldn't have gotten there eventually, but I don't think they quite got there in the time that they had. I don't think the engine was delivering the frame rates we needed, and, and that created problems. We had to keep redesigning characters and uh, levels and polygon counts needed to come down so that the engine wouldn't stall and freak at times. When things got bad between Check 6 and Equinox, when the mistrust between the leaders of those companies really got in the way of the game being completed, I kind of just stepped in to, to try to make sure that that at least a game got finished because honestly we were at a point where the game was not going to get finished literally there was one day when i came to work and our receptionist said go home they've sent everybody home we're done they're throwing in the towel they, they don't want to work with each other anymore I'm talking about the, the guys running the two companies and i said let me talk to them and and, and i literally put them in a room and mediated between them. And I think we were in there for like six hours. And finally, at the end of the day, they agreed at least to keep working together. I wouldn't say they were best friends. <laughs> Nobody hugged. But at least the game went on. And, and a game was finished. So that's, I guess that was my mission. My mission at some point just to, you know, was to try to get something out the door. I'm pretty convinced that that would have been the end. 
I mean, it's very possible somebody else would have stepped in and, and you know, somebody from Universal maybe would have said, look, there's a lot of money on the line here. You guys got to get it together. It was uh, not a high point in my career. And I, you know, but, but I have to say, we, you know, everybody involved tried to do the best they could under the circumstances. And there are just so many reasons why it went wrong. Some were technical, some were personal, some were, you know, management oriented, some were political. It was just sort of like a perfect storm of clusterfuck. It turned out badly. And, you know, most of the people who worked on it were talented people who were trying to do the best they could. There are two things, by the way, because, you know, I worked in the arcade industry for many years, and I have many, many very specific and pleasant <laughs> memories of my work in those days. I cherish those memories because they were pleasant and fun. A lot of the memories of Check Six are sort of tainted by it not being pleasant or fun and the pressures being very enormous as, you know, deadlines loomed and, you know, technically we were struggling to just get stuff done. We were probably understaffed for the scope of the design. Wish I remembered more, but uh, I, I don't. The other thing is when I get together with old colleagues and we reminisce, we talk about things, that, that keeps things fresh and I hear their perspectives and that helps trigger memories in me as well. I've not talked to anybody about this game since I left Check Six. It's a black hole of memory. If somebody from some Comic-Con or, or, or you know, whatever wanted to get a panel uh, of, of a bunch of us who worked on that game together to talk about it, I would be there in a heartbeat. I would, I, I would love to. Well, I wish you luck getting down to the bottom of it all. It is a very complicated story with a lot of moving parts. After this call, Warren discovered he had files left from Spyro 4 as he handed over 49 sound effects that were planned to have been in Crop Circle Country, with only 3 sound effects making it into the final game. The early concept of Spyro 4 being for an older audience is clearly shown through some of these audio files. These are from a build of the game dated to July 13th, 2002. Let's hear them!
Just a couple of days after the phone call with Warren, level designer Scott Smith, who we had originally sent a contact request on May 19, 2018, surprisingly replied eight months later. He was the designer for a level called Sparks Pond, which later morphed into Dragonfly Dojo. He also designed Cloud9 and began modeling Enchanted Forest before he left the company months before the game released. Since he started at Check 6 very early on, he has many pieces of info about the game's original design and plot. Yes, yeah, Scott Smith. I was a level designer there, and I helped create the layouts for a couple of the uh, different levels, as well as all the, like, helped figure out what the gameplay was going to be from moment to moment. It got renamed to Dragonfly Dojo, but when I worked on it, it was called Sparks Pond. Um, I actually left the company uh, before the game shipped, so they changed some of those things. And then I also worked on what is now called Cloud9. Originally, uh, you so Sparks was the follower that helps out uh, Spyro, and it was supposed to be where all the dragonflies sort of are born, and that was the, I guess, original tentative name for it back in the day. When the game came out, we got a copy and we sort of played it to see what it had turned into, and it was, uh, it was, it was really bad, kind of forgot about it. I left uh, Check 6, I went and worked with the original lead level designer on Spyro when I started working there. We were able to play it and have a good laugh at what it had become. We were working at Maya, building up the levels, we would send them to the art teams to get beautified. A lot of playtesting, so for Sparks Pond it was more of like a horseshoe kind of shape, where you started and where you ended. It would progress in sort of like an upward fashion, although I think we had reverse that at some point so that you were going more, you were descending rather than escalating through the, through the zone. What we observed was that with escalation, you never really see that far in front of you, so it's hard to, you're constantly having to pitch the camera upward to figure out where the hell you're supposed to go. And with uh, more of a descending kind of platformer, you could always see far into the distance, and it was a lot easier, and plus you could glide down and all that other good stuff. And then for Cloud9, again, it was, it was a lot of like jumpy puzzles and stuff like that. I think we had rainbow bridges in there as well. We were trying to also make use of the, the glide mechanics in that as well, quite a lot. So there was a lot of free-floating platforms that were sort of meant to be like held up by, by clouds and stuff, and uh, their bases were made out of clouds. It wasn't until much, much later in the development that we started actually placing enemy mobs, crystals that you collect, or I forgot what it was, even if it is crystals, uh, whatever the collection mechanics were. And I think you were supposed to like save dragonflies too, so we had you know, we're trying to figure out like hidden spots for the dragonflies and all that other good stuff. That's about as much as I remember about the actual production of it. It got really sketchy at the end, and honestly, it wasn't the Check Six so much as it was the publisher. There was one person in particular, Ricky Ricavina, who was our contact at Vivendi, and he so desperately wanted to be a lead designer that he would constantly try and insert his own designs into the game. I'm not even making this up. And so he, he really kind of stifled a lot of the creativity that the company had in terms of turning Spyro into what could have been a, a really good game, actually. It was bad. <laughs> it's really funny. When I started there, they had a design document and it had the story laid out and had all the different things that were supposed to happen. And the protagonist was supposed to be an evil dragon. And Ricky nixed it because he said there are no evil dragons in the Spyro universe. Cut to, like, I think it was like a year or so after Enter the Dragonfly came out. Another Spyro came out for, I think, the Nintendo DS or something like that. The main protagonist, an evil dragon. Basically, the original pitch was that there was this evil dragon who was siphoning all the essence from all the other dragons in order to make himself more powerful. And you were going and basically finding the dragon essences around, you know, Spyro Land and reclaiming those and then defeating him at the end. And yeah, that, that whole thing got mixed. So we had to bring back old bad guys as the, uh, the bosses in our game and sort of like shoehorn them into some random story that we came up with where they were like stealing dragonflies and shit. And then there was even one, one time where we, we were like constantly crunching. I came in and I went over to the artist that I was working with on Mark's Pond at the time. And I was talking to him about, you know, some, some of the changes and stuff like that. And, and I noticed on the screen that he was working on that level, but it didn't look like mine. And I was like, what's that? And he's like, oh, this is uh, Sparks Pond. I'm like, that doesn't look like my layout. He's like, oh no, Ricky came in on the weekend and gave me this, and he hands me a sheet of graph paper with a level design layout on it. So apparently Ricky had come in on the weekend and told the artist to make Sparks Pond into 
his level design and not the one that, that had been signed off and approved and worked on at our company. There was a lot of, a lot of uproar over that as well, about him coming in and, and doing shit like that. He, not single-handedly, but he definitely was a, a major influencer as to why that, that game did not do as well as it should have. I think it was Ricky's call to pull back the old bad guys and make them the bad guys again in this, in this version of it. So, it was his call. There was like a, what was it, like a, I, don't, I want to say a racing game, but I don't think it was even really racing. It was like you were sliding down uh, like a tube, like a, like a half pipe, and you were collecting stuff. I think that was one of the mini games. The focus changed from recovering uh, stolen dragon essence to recovering the dragonflies that had been stolen. Tammy put in a secret credits with a lot of our names in there, a bunch of people who had left prior to the game shipping. The company was going under, and we were getting paid every three weeks instead of every two weeks, and we needed money, so a bunch of us found other jobs. Yeah, it was me. I want to say Brian Reed was one of them, because he was the lead, original lead designer. Maybe Joel was another one, because he was also the original lead on the design side. A combination of keys that you enter on a particular screen, and then it, it all take you out to a secret credits list. Well, we accessed it. We, we did it. Like, when we, we bought the game for super cheap and uh, we played it, like I said, and uh, kind of laughed at how horrible it was. There were so many glitches. At the time, I knew the code and I entered it and uh, sure enough, there it was. As Scott said, there is indeed a hidden cheat code within Enter the Dragonfly that nobody has ever accessed. It was planted extremely deep within the code so that it couldn't be discovered by the higher-ups at Check 6 and Vivendi. Tammy Yap was the programmer who implemented the code, and when asked, simply replied with, Yeah, that seems like something I would do. Even Randolph remembers the secret credits code and told us that it had likely been removed by Jean-Marc Morel. But, Scott still firmly says he accessed the secret credits in the final version of the game. Regardless, we have reason to believe it still exists, but will be very hard to discover, especially because nobody has found it after all these years. Other early design aspects can be seen within the game, such as through the Atlas pictures. Those were screenshots taken from multiple builds of the game, ranging from the finalised levels and earlier versions. The images for Cloud9, Honey Marsh, and Jurassic Jungle appear to have the most changes to them. Cloud9's original design had purple textures on the structures and a different layout, whilst Honey Marsh also oddly has a purple hue over everything. Jurassic Jungle is just straight up a different layout than the final level, with different lighting, textures, skybox, and a larger volcano. The volcano seen in the background isn't the same as the final one, and is potentially the same volcano seen in the Volcano Slide minigame, as hacking the game lets us see all the detail they put into this model even though you never see it in the game. As for the game's assets, almost all assets for Spyro 4 were entirely destroyed. Although some have managed to survive the shutdown of Check 6 and escape Universal's hands, Warren and Joel still have many design documents of the game, and the artists at Equinox still have a good amount of concept art. However, we likely can't get access to that for a lot of legal issues, but it definitely still exists. Peering into the files of A Hero's Tale reveals several test levels left in by the developers. One level even includes this. An edited model of Hunter from Enter the Dragonfly. This shows us that at least back in 2004, two years after Spyro 4, assets from the game still existed and were being used as a basis for upcoming Spyro games. The honest truth is, the majority of Check 6 was filled with very talented people. People like Jason, Randolph, Warren and Saji. But when the heads of the three companies clashed, Spyro 4 became a huge cluster of different visions. Vivendi argued for a carbon copy of Spyro 3, Equinox argued for a pretty and detailed game with in turn a choppy frame rate, while Check 6 argued for an entirely brand new Spyro experience boasting 36 levels in all. None of the companies could agree on what type of game they wanted to make, causing what we know is Enter the Dragonfly. One thing's for certain, if Check 6 saw their vision to fruition, Spyro would have had a much different future. When everything is finally said and done, towards the end of the day, we can say we accomplished what we sought out to do. We learned the answers of Enter the Dragonfly's development that many had speculated upon for years. It was a very long journey that definitely had its ups and downs. As for the future of Spyro, it is in Toys for Bob's hands. Whether they decide to borrow ideas from Spyro 4 or not, only time will tell. 
There are many good ideas that they could mould into the next Spyro game. Now I think it's time we end everything off on a high note. We can't thank you enough for watching. We hope you learned everything you wanted to know about the game. We give our biggest thanks to Check6 Studios, especially Randolph. He helped uncover more details than anybody else could. Without Check6, none of this would have been possible. Even though we had our ups and downs, we hope members from Check6 can hit success again in the future, and perhaps maybe return to Spyro to show that they can make a great game after all. And please, be sure to remember, the story of Spyro 4 is not over. If you want more answers, be sure to investigate and feel free to share if you find anything new. There are many stories about this game still out there. As always, remember, your work is you, don't let you down. I've been Teal Game Master, but I'm going a little bit off script here, I'm just a narrator. Kyle is the one who put this thing together and he's absolutely brilliant, so be sure to sing his praises in the comments. We hope you enjoyed this documentary, have an amazing day, take care. My name is Teal Bald, I've mentioned it many times. What did they put as my name? Feeble! Welcome back everybody to Spyro Spyro Spyro!